Mr. Zagorski's attorney, Kelly Henry, was with us and left at around 7 to watch him be removed from his cell and led into the execution chamber. Um, while we were sitting in the uh, witness room before um, they raised the curtain, um, we heard clanking, we heard what sounded like a big bucket, um, some splashing of water. Um, you could hear um, what sounded like the guards fastening the restraints over Mr. Zagorski's body. Um, just up here. So, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Um, okay. Um, at 7:13. Uh, this is what I have. Um, the uh, tarp or the curtain was raised, uh, and we saw Mr. Zagorski staring straight ahead. He looked around the room a little bit, but for the most part was staring straight ahead, um, appeared to be looking at his attorney. Um, and the warden said, Mr. Zagorski, do you have any last words um, at this time? And then that's when Mr. Zagorski said, let's rock. Um, he seemed to, at some points, um, flash uh, uh, kind of a grin, but then as they put the sponge over his head and fastened um, the headpiece over him, uh, you could see him grimace as the water, um, they, they moistened the sponge over his head and you could see him grimace as the water fell down his face. Um, and, and they put the helmet on around 7.13 as well. Um, at 7.14, I uh, wrote down that they uh, wiped off his face, wiped, wiped the excess water uh, off of his face. Um, and Mr. Zagorski, at, at that point, appeared to say something, I think, to the guards, but I, I'm not sure what. Um, I also have that at 7.16, um, we saw the guards plug in this thick um, black cord with stripes on it that appeared to be connecting um, the electric chair to uh, electricity, uh, and I have here at 7, 16, and 30 seconds, the warden um, appeared to give the signal he wiped his hand over his face. Um, at this point, we could see Mr. Zagorski in the, in the final seconds before the current started, kind of lift his hands and, and what looked like a wave. Um, and then as the current started, uh, we could kind of hear the sound, it almost sounded like, a, like an elevator, um, the, the sound of the, the, the voltage starting, and you could see his um, fists clench, and it appeared as though his, um, his arms got red. Um, and like Kimberly said, he rose up against the restraints um, during while the voltage was flowing, and then his body would relax down again. His hands stayed in kind of a fist with his pinky kind of leaning over the armrest, and after the voltage stopped, um, he did not move and there was silence. Um, and I also have um, the time of death at 726. Hi, I'm Nicole Young. I'm the editor of the Robertson County Times. Um, like the people who spoke before me, um, we were in the dark. We could hear things happening uh, on the other side of the wall. Um, once we went into the room, it was a couple minutes before 7 when we were shown into the room. Um, we sat in the dark for a while. Um, and you could hear clanking and uh, the sound of a bucket and um, the sound of handcuffs um, being removed. It's what sounded like to me in chains. And you could hear him being strapped into the chair. Um, I have that uh, we heard over the radio at about 7.12 that the witnesses were in place and the curtain raised and Mr. Zagorski was smiling at um, people in the room. He looked around the room, looked at all of us, um, 
at about 7 13 the warden asked if he had any final words and he said let's rock um and they put a sponge on his head and he uh, was grimacing as they put the sponge over his head he alternated between smiling and grimacing during the sponge being put on his head and then he was they put a shroud over his face and um they re-wet the sponges around his, his ankles at about 7.15 and started mopping up the excess water that was on the floor around the electric chair. Two employees were wiping up the excess water from around the chair. Um, we observed them hooking up the power cord to the chair at about 7.16. Um, we heard the distinct sound of the electricity beginning at about the same time and saw him flex his hands. He lifted, I saw him lift his hands up, the right hand up multiple times before the electricity started. Um, but they, he did that and then all of a sudden his hands flexed into fists. Um, he stiffened raised up a little bit during the first jolt and then relaxed some but his hands stayed clenched um, with the pinky the right pinky over the chair rest um, at 717 I have that he had the second jolt and raised up in the chair even higher the second time um, and I also have the time of death at 7.26 p.m. It, from what I observed, it was, it was just kind of a calm sort of smile. That's what I saw. I'm Jason Lamb. I'm a reporter with News Channel 5 WTVF. Um, a lot of what uh, has already been said um, goes along with my notes. Um, we were in the dark for uh, several minutes in the witness room while we were able to hear the distinct sounds of what sounded like a water bucket being um, brought around. Uh, the, a ratcheting sound like you would hear with handcuffs um, being um, a, a put on or taken off uh, someone. Um, the, the blinds raised and um, you could see Mr. Zagorski uh, there looking out at us, uh, at, at the folks in the witness room directly ahead of him. Um, then the warden at said, quote, Mr. Zagorski, do you have any last words at this time? And that's when Mr. Zagorski said, let's rock. Um, he then, as others described, uh, grim between a grimace and a grin, as this large sponge uh, was put over his head, uh, along with the helmet, the headpiece, um, this is a large sponge covering, probably larger than the size of, of his entire head, uh, that went over his uh, over his own head and uh, underneath the headpiece. Um, the um, just go through my notes here. He was wearing white TDOC trousers with a. a dark stripe down the side that said Tennessee Department of Correction and a yellow shirt and he was he did seem to wave his hand or raise his left hand up um, as this whole process was continuing including after um, the cloth the shroud was put over his face it was a extremely large square black cloth uh, that was sort of pinned to the headpiece uh, to mask his entire face um, down past his chin. Um, before the shroud was put in place, I noticed he was raising his eyebrows at times. 
Um, and again, between grimacing and smiling, grimacing when the, the water, the salt water came down over his face. Um, I asked, and he seemed to be communicating to his attorney who was sitting next to me at the time, Kelly Henry. Um, I asked her about that after uh, the execution had finished. Um, as he was putting his eyebrows up, uh, the attorney sitting to my right was nodding, smiling, and tapping her heart. And I asked her what that meant, and she said, quote, I told him when I put my hand over my heart, that was me holding him in my heart. And uh, the execution uh, proceeded after he had the uh, shroud over his face. Um, again, as others have said, it was a sharp uh, jolt upwards with his fists clenched for 20 seconds. And then as the electricity was shut off, he sort of slumped uh, back down and remained motionless. Uh, and then after the pause, uh, it was re-energized, the chair was re-energized, and uh, he uh, lifted back up even higher. Um, and then after it was over, his body just slumped back down again with his uh, pinky finger sort of resting on the edge of uh, the chair handle. It seemed as if he was just standing up extremely straight uh, from, from what I could see. I don't know that his legs or his body actually came up off the chair, um, but from what I could tell, it looked like every, every muscle in his body was just extremely tense and clenched. While the electricity was going through him, he had a, a shroud over over his face, so we couldn't see. No, other than uh, after the warden asked him what, what his last words would be, and he said, "Let's rock." Blake Farmer, I'm a reporter at Nashville Public Radio. Um, and I don't know that I'll need to go through um, every last detail, but uh, just if other, as others have said, um, we were in this quiet, dark room, um, and the the curtain lifted, and um, and Mr. Zagorski, of course, was already um, strapped in. We've been able to hear a little bit on the other side of the window, um, and uh, you know he's sort of looking around and and sort of uh, seeing who all is in there watching and. Um, those people, besides the, the five of us who are journalists, also include the, the Riverbend chaplain, um, an attorney from the Attorney General's office, um, and then, of course, uh, Mr. Zagorski's attorney as well. Um, so, as everyone said, um, he was asked for his final words and, and said, let's rock. Um, and then certainly was giving some signals uh, to his attorney who was there on the front row. and. Um, as Jason said, holding her hand over her heart, and uh, he would kind of, uh, you know, pull his eyebrows up and down a little bit uh, as they were putting the sponge, which is huge, on top of his head. Um, but his face was, uh, you know, I don't think you could read too much into it. He was, uh, you know, I think trying to stay positive or something because he was, he was kind of keeping a smile, but then grimacing every once in a while. Um, and then shortly after that, though, they put the shroud over his face and, and we didn't see anything more except we could see his hands, which he lifted a couple of times, um, if I recall, each of them once or twice. Um, and then uh, after the chair was hooked up to the power, um, the, the, uh, it, I believe the guards, other than one of them, left the room, uh, who'd been working around him this whole time wetting the sponge on his head, wiping his face off, wetting the sponges that are also around his ankles. Um, and then the power sort of uh, energized the chair without a big 
noise that you might would expect. Um, really, you just hear the sound of electricity and his body raising up. His elbows seem to come up off of the um, off of the chair itself. Uh, his feet weren't on the floor anyway. I mean, he's strapped in over the shoulders, over the arms. Um, so, uh, but his body certainly lifting up. Then uh, the jolt goes off. Um, he's perfectly still, and then. Uh, Several seconds later, another jolt comes on. He goes even higher, and then um, the energy cuts off, and we sit there and uh, in stillness and and watch his fists still clenched with that one pinky uh, off the edge of the chair, and uh, sit there for a good long while looking for any signs of life. Um, and it was it was several minutes after that that uh, he was even pronounced dead, and that was at 7:26 p.m. Were you able to see the victim? Uh, th there was no one else in the room with with us, as far as I I, I know. Yeah. You know, you're watching somebody um, somebody's life taken um, at the hand of the state, and so it's a it's a serious, somber. Thing to be in that room, um, and so uh, you know. It, but it's all over. It, at least today, it was it was all over fairly quickly, and and uh, seemed seemed to be done in a very uh, professional way. It wouldn't be something I'd be able to tell, and and certainly at once the shroud and by shroud, it really I don't know what it's made out of. It looked like it could have been a leather. Um, black piece of leather that was draped over his face. There was nothing to see there. He didn't seem to be doing anything with his hands that would say pain. Um, no, he, he seemed to be, you know, in, in good spirits, um, all things considered. My name is Kelly Henry, and um I am one of Mr. Sikorsky's attorneys. The last three days since Mr. Sikorsky has been on death watch, it has been his sincere desire to make sure that everyone who was around him, who worked with him, be they prison guards or his legal team, um, be at ease. It was very important to him that today not be a day of sadness for us. He very much wanted a light mood um, he was in a light mood every time I saw him, every time um, I have spoken with him. We had a discussion about what was the last thing he wanted to see, and he said the last thing he wanted to see was me smiling, and so I tried very hard to do that. And we did have um, the understanding that if I was placing my hand over my heart, that meant I was holding him in my heart. And I asked him to just make sure and look at me and to know that there was someone in the room representing his entire legal team, which is very large. I am merely one of many people who have worked on behalf of Mr. Zagorski for a number of years and who have come to care for him very much. Um, as the others have stated, at approximately 7 o'clock, um, myself and the Assistant Attorney General, uh, Scott Sutherland, were escorted into the area just outside where Mr. Zagorski um, was being held. As per the protocol, um, several guards um, approached him as the warden approached the front of the cell first to let him know that it was time for the guards to come in to um, extract him from the cell. Uh, I was not in the room at that point. I could only see through the window to the cell, but I could hear Mr. Zagorski um, say, and I wrote it down, so I want to get it right. He said, first of all, I want to make it very clear. I have no hard feelings. I don't want any of you to have this on your conscience. You are all doing your job. And I'm good. Um, they then asked Mr. Zagorski to get to the back of the cell, which is the protocol. Um, about four guards by my count 
um, rushed in and um, I assume at that point um, restrained him in the belly chains and um, leg irons and um, handcuffs that he was wearing as they then walked him um, into the execution chamber. After Mr. Zagorski was out of the cell, the door opened, Mr. Um, Sutherland and I got in line behind the procession. The procession included um, the facility maintenance supervisor, the warden, the associate deputy warden, and approximately um, six or seven guards by my count, um, one in front and the rest behind Mr. Zagorski. They walked behind him. Um, asked him to sit in the chair. As they asked him to sit in the chair, there were three guards who placed their hands on him, one in particular in the middle of his chest to hold him in place while um, he was restrained. Two other guards entered the room. They immediately began the process of restraining Mr. Zagorski. He was restrained across his lap. There was a, um, a crisscross strap that goes across the, the shoulders and the torso. Um, and this is to prevent the body from actually being able to rise from um, the chair. His wrists were both strapped tightly. At that point, um, two guards came. They put the sponges around his ankles. They have to put the natural sea sponges in a saline solution. They put one on each side of the ankle and restrained it. At one point, Mr. Zagorski um, told them that it seemed a little loose and they needed to tighten it. He um, would look at me and smile and a few times told me, chin up. Um, I put my hand on my heart and I smile back. After that was over and he was restrained, those guards um, got into a military formation and left the room. At that point, the only people left in the room were myself, the associate deputy warden, the warden and the facility maintenance supervisor, and Mr. Sutherland. The warden offered me an opportunity to say whatever I wanted to say. And I just said, we're good, put my hand across my heart. He looked at me, I smiled at him, he smiled back at me. I walked out of the room with Mr. Sutherland and joined the media witnesses. Um, after that, most of what you have heard comports with my memory, um, I would add just um, a few things. Um, when the water was dripping over his, um, it, the, when they put the sponge on his head and the water was dripping the saline water, so that's a salt water solution, so it's probably a little irritating. Um, he would raise his eyebrows, he would grimace and then he would raise his eyebrows and smile. Um, I understood that to be him encouraging me to smile. He was very clear that he did not want me to have a sad look on my face because that was not what he wanted to see. He wanted to see smiles. And so I, I saw that as him prompting me to make sure that I smiled, um, which I did. And um, after that, the words that I heard him say to the guard as they were wiping his face is, um, there's a little bit under my nose. And after um, he said his last words, which were, let's rock, and the warden gave his signal. I believe the sound that a lot of people were hearing, it was actually the exhaust fan that was um, turned on. That's part of the protocol. Um, Mr. Zagorski's body did get into um, what the experts call a tetanized state, so that every single muscle in his body um, became immediately rigid, and that happens as the current goes from the, the cradle cap, which has the, the highest curtain, it basically is circling the body, going down one side and round and back up the next, and when it does that, every single bot, um, nerve is on fire and the body is tense, so the fact that we couldn't hear any noise coming from Mr. Zagorski is really not surprising given the way um, that electrocution works. Any real violence to be seen would have been seen underneath that shroud. The shroud is um, clamped here to here, covers here, and then goes to about right here, and it is very wide. There is no way to um, see underneath that and no way to um, see the burns that will be obvious when um, the medical examiner examines the body. The, 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 that's when we'll see the extent of the burns. I focused on his hands and his stomach. Um, for the most part, I couldn't really see his feet. I would have to rise to look at his feet some. Um, his hands remained 
um, clenched after the, the, they were immediately clenched and they remain clenched except for the pinkies. And I saw both pinkies appear to either be dislocated or broken. Um, that's not surprising because we do know that in an electrocution, the body suffers blunt force injuries as a result of it straining against the strap. And as it appeared as though he was actually sitting up, you have to realize that's very hard for that body to actually get up like that considering all the straps and how tightly they have him strapped to the chair. So there was a lot of force involved um, with the electrical current being applied to his body. It appeared to me that his stomach was continuing to rise and fall between the first and second um, application of the current, indicating to me that there was still respiration between um, the end of the first current and the second current. Um, I was watching for his belly. Mr. Zagorski had a bit of a belly, and um, so I was looking for that at, at, at signs of his breathing. Um, as far as my observations, I think that um, everything else I would concur with what others had said. Um, I also have the announcement of the time of death as being 726. Um, and with your indulgence, I have a final prepared statement. Mr. Zagorski spent the last 34 years on death row, living as a model inmate, even saving the life of a guard. He was loved by many and leaves behind numerous friends. The world is not safer because of his execution and justice was not served tonight. Horrifically, Mr. Zagorski was forced to choose between 10 to 18 minutes of chemically burning from the inside while paralyzed or being literally burned to death in less than a minute. He should never have been forced to make that choice. Neither of Tennessee's current options for execution are humane or constitutional. The state must find a better method of execution that comports with the innate dignity of all human beings and the constitutional protection from torture. Thank you. So um, I have represented a number of, of men and women. I've been doing this work for a quarter of a century. Um, when we get to this point, we understand that the chances of the Supreme Court acting are not great, but that doesn't stop us from raising claims that we know are righteous and true because the only way that we stop these injustices is to keep speaking truth to power. Um, we certainly believed in the righteousness of what we brought to the Supreme Court and we hoped that we would be able to get enough votes for a stay. Um, and if we didn't do that, we hope we at least brought light to what is a barbarous act that is being done by the state to fellow citizens. Um, I didn't know when the Supreme Court, you're the first person to tell me when they denied the stay. I assume that they denied the stay when they brought us in um, to the room. Um, you're always hopeful. Uh, I remember when Philip Workman was on um, death row and received a stay of execution 26 minutes before he was scheduled to die. Um, when nobody thought that, that would happen, he lived another seven years. So you're always hopeful, but realistic. Mr. Zagorski was fairly clear from the time that he went over that he was not going to get a stay. And he was at peace and in fact said, they're killing his body, but they're setting his spirit free. Horrible. That's nothing that you ever want to do. And nobody in law school ever thinks that they're going to stand in front of a federal court and ask to have their client electrocuted. They don't prepare you for that. Did Mr. Zagorski have any contact with Mr. Zagorski had messages from his mother. Um, she's in a nursing home. Um, and has been quite ill for some time. Um, other relatives, he had a very close relationship with his aunt and his um, cousins, and they all sent messages to him, as well as numerous friends that he had uh, along the way who sent messages to him, and he sent messages back, all of love, forgiveness, and grace. When you say messages, 
phone calls that, that we then delivered to him. In the, in the time before his death, um, did Zimbersky ever indicate trying to make a statement of sorts about the death penalty through some of his actions, perhaps in his last will of choice? He, no, he wasn't making a statement about the death penalty at all. Thank you all very much.